Hello. I want to welcome everyone to another Sunday School Lesson Review broadcast for Sunday, January the 21st, 2024. The lesson review is taken from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 16. The title of the lesson is A High Calling. I am your host for this lesson, Minister William Gadsden. I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. You see, it is Jesus that enables us to get the Word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church located in the Colleen Fort Cavazos, Texas area. Our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. If you wish, you can reach us by telephone at area code 254-680-4378. But if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. You can also communicate with us by email. Our email address is greaterpeacemvc at peoplepc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. Again, I am your host for this lesson, Minister William Gatson, and I thank God for you supporting this ministry. So without further ado, let us begin with prayer before we begin our Sunday School lesson. Please join me in this word of prayer. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. Because it is your amazing grace that makes all of these things possible. You have given man the technology to provide to us that we might have the means to deliver a message to to the listening public that's out there. But we realize, Lord, that this is your works. And that we talk, we're talking about your word. And we thank you for the amazing grace. We thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to go with us. Go with me as I go through this lesson. Go with those that are listening. And I ask that they ask the Holy Spirit as I'm asking the Holy Spirit to be with them as we go through this lesson. This is my prayer, and I ask it in the name of Jesus, if it be thy will. Amen. Now, the introduction to a high calling is thus. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians. However, our lessons so far, our lessons that is so far, have concentrated on chapters 1 and 2 of Ephesians. Chapter 1 of Ephesians informed us that we as Gentiles were chosen in Christ also. Now, in previous lessons in, throughout history, Gentiles were listed as basically Jews call them dogs. They say they call them also the uncircumcised. The Jews did not go into areas of uh not they did they did not go normally into gentile areas and if they did when they got outside of the city limits or wherever they went they would shake the dust off their feet to basically indicate that they didn't want to have any part to that gentile uh, uh community now chapter two informed us of two things about uh gentiles we are god's workmanship and we are members of god's household just like everybody else that accepts Jesus. And that includes, we are no different than they, than the Jews are nowadays because of the death of, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, the lessons skipped over chapter 3 of Ephesians and continued with chapter 4. I would like to concentrate on Ephesians chapter 3 in this introduction because I think it is essential knowledge for Gentiles because it addresses three things that the Holy Spirit revealed to Paul about Gentiles and the plan God always had for Gentiles from the beginning. So, beginning, the first one, in chapter 3, Paul reveals a mystery about God and the Gentiles. That's taken from Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. Then we go to Paul reveals the purpose of the mystery. That is Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 8 through 13. And finally, Paul reveals why Gentiles should appreciate the mystery. And that's taken from Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 14 through 21, which takes us to the end of the the chapter. So, if you will, let me present Ephesians chapter 3 for all Gentiles. 
Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and we read, I'm going to be reading the first uh, seven verses, and this is the section called The Mystery Revealed. For verse, starting at verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been revealed by the, whole, by the Spirit, that is, to his holy apostle and prophet, that is, Paul himself. Now, verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a member minister according to the gifts of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So we see this mystery was revealed because before Gentiles were not considered in the realm of God's chosen, but we're going to find out that uh, the death, the resurrection of Jesus made it all possible that we are equal now with the Jews. No, there's no difference between us. So that is the mystery revealed. He said, he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written by which you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of God. And that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Now, let's go to the prop, the purpose, that is, of the ministry. Not ministry, purpose of the mystery, that is. Verse 8 starts off, says, To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, Paul was basically probably the less likely person you would think would be talking to the Gentiles about Jesus because he persecuted the church in the beginning. But he's saying, now I am led because of what he has been doing to the church. He says, I, to me, possibly saying that who am less than the least of all saints, his grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles unsearchable true riches of Christ. Paul did not was not an apostle of Jesus, but he received the same teachings that the apostles received through the Holy Spirit as he was in basically once he decided to follow Jesus. And verse 9 says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. There is this mystery about the Gentiles, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of the heavenly places. So now he's saying to make all that is to the fellowship of the mystery, basically letting us know what Jesus has said. Now this is a mystery. Jesus revealed many mysteries when he came and he and during his ministry here on earth. And one of the biggest ministries I think it is, is he said Ten Commandments. You don't need if you're going to follow the Ten Commandments, there's only two commands you have to worry about. That is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. So, these were things that the Jews were familiar with. They didn't accept Jesus while he was here, but that's what he, he says. And to make all see what it is, what is the fellowship of, of the mystery, which from the beginning, now again, repeating this again, of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus. God did not reveal all of these things, but he's revealing it now to he revealed it now to to Paul to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which his he accomplished in Jesus Christ in Christ Jesus that is our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. We have boldness and confidence. It says that we have to come boldly to Christ to ask for forgiveness of sin because he is our intercessor now. 
Now, verse 13 says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your, your glory. Paul is saying, I, he knew he was in prison at this time. He says, don't worry about me, but listen to what the message is saying. And it says, that is basically, that, 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 do not lose heart at my tribulations, which is your glory. Yeah, it's all I'm, I'm saying these things for you, to enrich you, to show you how to serve the Lord. And then we get to the final section, appreciation of the mystery. Now, the mystery has been revealed that the Gentiles are equal to the Jews, that we have the same rights that they have with, through Jesus when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And verse 14 starts off by saying, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, so the Gentiles are basically being introduced to Jesus. Paul has done that well. He's, he's basically teaching them now, but he's not there with them at this point. He says, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, which is, in the, which is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the powers that work in us, to him be glory and the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So you don't have to worry about whether you're Jew or Gentile now in serving God. And you don't have to worry about God being... Uh, not basic God, God has not accepting you as a Gentile because this is saying that this is that mystery and we are, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Now, the Holy Spirit gifts believers with different supernatural abilities to serve Christ and one another. The gift of exhortation, which was mentioned in our lessons today, is a person's unique ability to, to, enc to encourage and edify others. Now, this exhort being exhortation basically says this person delights in finding scriptures that apply to a situation and teaching others how to apply these scriptures. And so that is basically, when we look at that, we can say that to exhort is to develop relationships with other believers for the purpose of encouraging them in their spiritual growth. Now, part of Timothy's job as a young minister was to encourage and admonish those within the flock. Paul had left Timothy in charge of the churches in Ephesus, and he's sending this letter to him. It says, God told pastors, God holds pastors responsible for the spiritual well-being of those in their care. And exhortation is part of keeping them spiritually healthy. Exhortation basically is develop a relationship with other believers, and that's what this is saying. And this my Christian friends, is the end of my introduction. I hope something has been said that will help you. Uh, this is what I deem might be something that might be of interest to you. So let's get to our lesson, and our lesson title is A High Calling. The lesson text is taken from Ephesians 4, chapter, verses 1 through 16. The golden text is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, and it reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation Wherewith ye are called. There are three uh, uh, sections for our lesson outline, and the first one is unity, taken from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 6. Next one is gifts, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 7 through 10. And finally, benefits, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 through 16. So let's get started with unity. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Starting at verse 1, it says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Paul is repeating what he stated in Ephesians 3, 1, that he is a prisoner of the Lord. Paul at this time was a prisoner in Rome, but he specifically states that he was a prisoner of the Lord also. Paul mentions that in the epistle, but mentions this in the epistle, but he does not, he does so to show that he was not ashamed of his present status as a prisoner. 
Paul knew that he was a prisoner not because he was an evildoer, but because he must suffer. As Jesus told Ananias in Acts the ninth chapter, verses 15, in NIV version saying, for the sake of Jesus, and it reads thus, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias was the one that came, went to Paul when he was on the Damascus road and he lost his sight and he went to Paul and, and he basically touched him and gave, his, and gave him back his sight. But he didn't want to do that. But the Lord says, go, Danis, go. This man is my chosen instrument. Uh, Matthew Henry recounts the words of Paul with respect to his imprison, imprisonment. He was in prison, as I said, in Rome. And he says, I now come with an earnest request of you, not to send me relief, nor to use your in, inter, interest for, my obtain, for the obtaining of my liberty. The first thing which poor prisoners are wont to solicit from their friends, but that you should appro would approve yourselves good Christians and live up to your profession and calling, that you walk worthy, worthily, agreeably, suitably, and courageously to those happy circumstances into which the grace of God has brought you, whom he was converted whom he has converted from heathenism to Christianity. Now, verse 2 says of our lesson says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearance, and forbearing one another in love. Paul refers to lowliness as the understanding and use, and uses humility in relationship with others as a means to oppose pride within oneself. That is, Paul said lowliness Basically, that's, and humility, that, that puts a damper on pride and, and basically covetousness also. Meekness is the unwillingness to not provoke others and avoid angry resentments and uh, peeviousness. Long-suffering is the ability to be patient and avoid injury to others. For bearing one another in love is Paul's way of saying, bear one another's infirmities with love. Verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. A Christian should seek to attain all of the above things, that is, uh, endeavoring all of the things that we mentioned so far, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, and forbearing others in love. Now, doing these things, Paul says, is an endeavor to keep the unity, can, and, and, to keep, and the unity cannot be obtained unless these things are done in the church. Unity in the church is necessary. So all should endeavor to keep peace within the church, and each member should seek to use the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do this. This unity of heart and affection may be said to be of the Spirit of God. It is wrought by Him and is one of the fruits of the Spirit as well. Now, verse 4 says of this section, says, There is one body... One spirit and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Each of the of our bodies has only one heart, and all good Christians make up one body, incorporated by one character that is alive by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who the who provides the gifts and graces to govern that this one body that we're living in. So there is one body, one spirit, and even as ye are in one, in one hopes of your calling. So you don't have a human body doesn't have two part, two hearts. It only has one, and that one heart is dedicated to one spirit. Now verse five says, "Our Lord, one faith, one baptism. Christians serve the Lord, uh, serve the one Lord Jesus Christ. Christians have one faith, which is gospel that contains the doctrine of Christian faith, which is a faith." In Christ, it saves us. Christians have one baptism, a baptism that they profess by their faith, by allowing themselves to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Verse 6 says, There's one God, our, one, God, our, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. All true Christians serve one God, who is the Father of all members of his church. This one God is above all things, through all things, and he, if you are his, lives in all of us, all Christians. He lives in all you all. Now, the above verses can be looked at as an exhortation of mutual love and unity. Definition, as I said, of a, or exhortation. I mentioned it in my uh, uh, introduction, but I'll mention it again here. The Holy Spirit gifts the believers with different supernatural abilities to serve Christ and one another. The gift of exhortation is a person's unique ability to encourage and edify others. This person delights in finding scriptures that apply to a situation and teachings uh, and teach others how to apply them. To exhort is to develop a relationship with other believers for the purpose of encouraging them in their spiritual growth. Now, that concludes the first section. Let's go to the next section, which is gifts. Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 10. Now, this section refer references what Jesus did after his death. Many have heard or read about Jesus going to Hades to retrieve the just souls in paradise after his death on the cross. Now, paradise was a place the souls of men went prior to the coming of Jesus. Paradise was described as being located in the depths of the earth and was divided into two sections. One section held the souls of those who believed God and obeyed his commandments, and the other section of paradise was where those who did not believe in God and did not obey his commandments resided. Now these two sections were separated by a great chasm and no one uh, in Hades could travel to Abraham's bosom and no one from Abraham's bosom could travel to the place of torment because the place of torment was what it was designed to be, a place of torment. Now Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 31, describe what Jesus said about a beggar and named Lazarus and a rich man who lived sumptu sumptuously before his death. But both upon their death went to a place called paradise. Lazarus went to the section described as the bosom of Abraham, which was a place of comfort. And the rich man went to the place designated for non-repentant sinners, and this place was called a place of torment, where the souls of individuals was living in torment because they refused to accept Jesus and believe in him, believe in God for that matter. Verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Jesus provides believers with an unmerited favor of God towards man, which is defined as grace. Grace is the unmerited service that God provides us because of the death, because of his son Jesus' death. Now, this grace is given to all Christians, and in addition to grace, they are given gifts of grace for the mutual benefit of the church of Jesus Christ, the church that Jesus will come back to receive someday. Verse 8 says, Wherefore he has, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, King David referenced these words in Psalm, the, the, basically this uh, same words, cap, let captivity high, captivity captive. Now, by and basically, saw, he did. David did this in Psalm sixty-eight, verse eighteen, by describing what Jesus did before his resurrection, saying, "Thou didst ascend the high mount, leading captives in thy train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there." <laughs> Excuse me. Dr. J. Vernon McGree, Dr. J. Vernon McGee makes the following statements about David, what David said in Psalm 68, 18. He says, when the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven after his death, I think he did two things. First, he took with him to heaven all those saints of the past who were in paradise. The paradise, as I said, in the in earth where Jesus went when he died on the cross before his resurrection. God had saved them on credit up to that time. 
That is, they were there, and God had saved them on credit because he put them over there in, 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 in a place called, basically, the place he looked at was Abraham's bosom. But our Lord paid the redemptive price for them when he died on the cross. They were there in paradise living a good life. And but he basically <coughs> excuse me, paid the redemptive price for them when he died on the cross. He took them, that is a spirit of just men made perfect into the presence of God. Now the second thing he did, he gave gift to me, gifts to men on earth, so that today he carries on his work through those to whom he had given those gifts. Every person who is in the body of Christ has a gift. Not all have the same gift, of course. As you may see, this is a marvelous verse. So the gifts of men that he gave to them basically is, we'll read about that when we get to the last section, is he gave us the gifts that we might use basically while we're here on earth to tell everybody else and to convince others of the, the benefits of serving Jesus and accepting him as Lord and Savior. Now, verse 9 says, now he is sent now he now that he ascended, what is it but he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? Verse ten says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up afar above the heavens that he might fill all things. So upon his death Jesus visited uh, this place called Paradise, and he basically took those that were in the section called Abraham's bosom, and took him to heaven when he basically ascended to heaven. In verse 9 above, we are told about the one who ascended, and that person was Jesus Christ. Then we are told in verse 10 that the one who ascended, Jesus, that is Jesus, was the one who descended first into the lower part of the earth, that is in paradise. Now the early church fathers saw in it the work of Christ, work of Christ in bringing the Old Testament saints out of paradise, up to the throne of God. Now, the only people in paradise now are those that are in the lake of, uh, basically in a place of torment. Jesus took everyone out that had obeyed him and accepted him in paradise. Abraham's bosom was referred to in scripture. Now, although the Apostles' Creed states that he descended into hell, hell is not, this is not the meaning of hell. It means Hades. In the book of Revelation, we are told that hell is not populated at this time. The first residents of hell will be the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan in, in himself in that order. So nobody's in hell, even though it's a place God has, God has prepared for Satan and his angels. And now, for those that don't believe or accept him and do not obey him, while they live on earth, they're going there too. Now this will occur during, these things will have, occur basically uh, during the great white throne judgment where Jesus sends all non-believers. This is, we're talking about hell at this point now. We're not talking about Hades. This will occur during the great white throne judgment where Jesus sends all non-believers or those who, whose name is not written in the book of life to the physical place called hell. Hell and not Hades is a place God prepared for Satan and his angels. But non-believers in Jesus will be sent there also. Because where what else would he send them? He can't send them to heaven because they're sinners. And there will be no sin in heaven. Now, in, in, in the incarnation uh, uh, and death of Jesus were his humiliation and descent. And they were adequate to bring the redeemed of the Old Testament into the presence of God. Now we get to the last of the section here called benefits. What are the benefits of what we've talked about already? Ephesians 4, chapter, verse 11 through 16. Verse 11 says that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Paul is saying that at his ascension, Jesus gave gifts to men. These gifts that he gave, these are, these are the gifts Jesus gave to men. Just not all of them, but some, most of the most important ones, I would say. He gave gifts to men when he made them apostles. Now, these, uh, these uh, basically the apostles were Christ that we're talking about here, immediately called. They were, furnished, they were furnished with an extraordinary gift. 
and the powers of working miracles with inf infamabilities in delivering uh, his truth. And they, having been the witnesses of his miracles and doctrine, he sent them forth to spread the gospel and to plant the, the, and govern churches. You see, these, uh, when we, the gifts that he gave the apostles was to give them the ability and, and mir or miraculous powers to go out and convince the world that Jesus was the Son of God, and he came here for the same purpose, to redeem mankind from the sin that they are in, the they, original sin that Adam passed on to others. So these are the, basically the apostles were referring to Jesus as apostles. Now, he also gave gifts to men as prophets. Now, there are no prophets now. The prophet, when people say they're prophets, but the, the Old Testament prophets, when you look at a description of those, uh, all of the things that have been fulfilled that the prophets talked about. So what is the prophet going to talk about anymore? He says he gave gifts to men as prophets. The prophets seem to have been such as expounded the writing, writings of the Old Testament and foretold of things to come. That's what the prophets did. And so these were basically the prophets of old. Now, you, you might say that John the Baptist was the last prophet because he was not a New Testament uh, person. He basically came to he came at time to proclaim the name of Jesus. Now he gave gifts. That is, Jesus gave gifts to men to become evangelists. Now, who were evangelists? Evangelists. Uh, were ordained persons whom the apostles took for their companions in travel and sent them out and settled, settle and established such churches as apostles deemed apostles themselves had planted. So they, the evangelists, you look at it, you could consider Titus as an evangelist and basically you could consider Timothy, I suppose, as evangelists, even though they were pastors of churches. Now, he gave gifts and made some men pastors. Pastors are such as pastors are such as are fixed at their head at the head of a particular church with designs to guide, instruct, and feed them in the manner appropriate appointed by Christ. <clears throat> he also gave gifts and made many teachers. The teachers were those whose work was also to preach the gospel and to instruct the people by way of exhortation. Now we see here that it is Christ's prerogative to appoint what, what officers and offices he pleases in his church. These are the, what gifts is he going to give to those in the church? And how rich is a church that had at first such a variety of officers and still has such a variety of gifts? How kind is Christ to his church? How careful of it and of his edification. When he ascended, he proclaimed the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the gift of the Holy Spirit was ver are various. Uh, some among them have teach greater, uh, and some less. Measures that all of the good body, which brings us to the third argument. Now, verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of the gifts that Jesus provides are for the perfecting of saints. That is, according to the import of the original, to bring unto, into an orderly spiritual state and frame those who had been, at, as it were, dis, dislocated and disjoined by sin, and then to strengthen, confirm, and advance them therein, that so each in his proper place and function might contribute to the good of the whole things. So God basically, he gave these, left these men, he gave these gifts to men that they might be able to go out to the world because he started with 12. And now if you look here, 2,000 years later, we are basically, the, the Bible is basically established and the Church of Christ is established. So the, for the work of ministry or for the work of dispensation, that is that they might dispense the doctrine of gospel and successfully discharge the several parts of their ministerial, ministerial function, be they prophets, apostles, well, maybe mostly priests, evangelists, and uh, things of that nature right now. 
Now, verse 13 says, Till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature, stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, the gifts and offices, some of them which have been spoken of, are to continue in the church till the saints be perfected, which will not be till they all come in the unity of the faith, that is, till the true believers meet together by means of the same precious faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God when we meet in, together in heaven. Verse 14 says, When we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The apostles further showed us, shows in the following verses what was God's design in the sacred institutions and what effect they ought to have upon us that we henceforth be no more children. You see, children are easily imp imposed upon. They easily impress. We must take care of this. Don't be so easily impressed by what the world say, what you see in the world or hear in the world and of being tossed to and fro like ships without ballast and carried about like clouds in the air with such doctrine as have no truth nor solidity, solidity in them, but nevertheless spread themselves far and wide and are therefore compared to the wind. So children basically are easy imposed upon. We're not supposed to be like children. We're supposed to be adults and follow what Jesus has said. But speaking the truth in love, May basically these people may grow up into him in all things, which is ahead, even Christ. So speaking of the truth, they are going out to speak the truth, basically because of Jesus Christ, head of their head. And he's basically said, gave us a great commission, and that's what we're to do. And we are to do these things all the time, whenever we have opportunity to do it. We should speak the truth in love, follow the truth in love, be sincere in love to our fellow Christians. While we adhere to the doctrine of Christ, which is a truth, we should live in love one with another. Love is basically a word that we need to have as Christians. Understand, have and understand. Verse 16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint sup supplied according to the effectual working in the me measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Christians receive their gifts and graces from Christ for the sake and benefit of the whole body that is the church of Christ, the, the, his, his church. Unto the edifying of itself in love, we may understand this two ways, either that all the members of the church may attain a greater measure of love to Christ and to one another, or that they may are moved to act in a manner mentioned from love to, uh, uh, to Christ and to one another. And they, basically, this is, my Christian friends, is the end of my Sunday school lesson, and I think it holds the essence of what the Sunday school lesson is all about. So let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, your amazing grace your grace and mercy has brought us to this point, Lord. And we listen to your word and we ask that your word, that this word, Lord, that keep us in your stead and do not pass us by. Help us to continue in your grace and your mercy. We thank you for it. We thank you for what you've done for Gentiles, making us equal to the Jews. Even though they're still your chosen people, we are basically your chosen, you might say, because we're equal to the Jews, because you have given us the grace that we so need and necessary to forgive us forgiveness of sin. We can go to you. And Lord, we thank you for that. And we praise you. And I ask that all of those that are listening have a special blessing, if it be thy will, upon given to, if it be thy will. In Jesus' name is my prayer. And I ask it all. Amen.